of excited youngsters. These were very happy years for Dinah. She loved life at sea, caring for the children, travelling to new places, and the warm social life of the ship's company. But after several years, and her mother getting older, she eventually felt it right to come ashore and support her. Francis by then had already left sea to marry me after we had met on one of the cruises when I went as a chaplain. We were to meet Dinah and her mother, Mrs. Elston, several times in the years that followed when Dinah brought her to tea with us when we lived in Marlborough. But we never really knew much about her early life, except that she and her brother were born in Highgate in London and that she went, I think, to a private school, a convent, I believe. I remember once when I asked her if she liked it at school, she said, well, at least they taught me how to be a lady. <laughs> she went on to become a nurse and was proud that she had trained at the well-known Westminster Hospital, where she qualified when she was 22. Well, after she'd left sea, Dinah trained as a health visitor and worked for some years in and around Isha while living with her mother in Weybridge in Surrey. But she wanted a base for her own to get away to. And that is when she found her beloved little thatch here in this beautiful corner of Hampshire. I'm sure she would say that buying it was one of the best things that she ever did because she's always loved her cottage and the countryside around it. Well, the years moved on. But in her mid-fifties, she surprised us one day by telling us that she'd been introduced to a delightful man and how well they were getting on. We were delighted. But time went on and we wondered if it was actually ever going to come to anything. But one day she came to see us with a broad smile on her face and a diamond ring on her finger. Ah, I said, has he popped the question at last? Well, not quite, she said. I got fed up waiting, so I went out and bought this ring, and then told us this was the engagement ring he was giving me. He just popped it onto my finger. Well, she and John Haynes were married in this church in 1981. John was a delightful, kind and gentle man who had been teaching for many years at the prestigious Reading School for Boys and risen to the position of deputy headmaster. A few of his former pupils, who Diana always called John's boys, have kept in touch with her since those days. And I'm delighted that one of them, Terry Cartwright, is with us today, and he's now going to play a short tribute. something of a fraud because I don't really know a lot about Diana. Diana. I didn't even know her real name is Diana. I've always known her as Diana. I used to address her as Diana, send letters and postcards and Christmas cards to her as Diana and she knows her But uh, I'm here to speak today about her marriage to John and the impact on both their lives. Um, I'm one of the former pupils of Redmond School and uh, as it happens, I was never taught by John, but I became friendly with him and got to know him quite well after leaving school through old boys cricket. Um, those of you that knew him will recall that he was a shy, diffident, retiring man, almost reclusive in my recollection. And uh, I thought when I was thinking about what to say today, um, that I could not imagine John getting down on his knees and actually proposing. But as we now hear from Peter, he didn't actually do that. <laughs> um, but uh, they, they clearly had a wonderful relationship and were very good and brought a lot of joy and pleasure to each other. Um, I have a little story um, that occurred. I couldn't recall the date of their wedding, but it must have been some seven or eight years after they got married, I was running a small advertising agency in London at the time, and we had a Christmas lunch one December for our clients, and um, I was staggering along Piccadilly, 
to take a young lady, probably half my age, she was hanging onto my arm, back to her hotel because she'd come down from Bradford. Coming in the other direction were Dinah and John, and they latched onto me, and clearly Dinah thought I was up to no good. What was actually <laughs> happening was that the young lady had had so much to drink at lunchtime that she needed me to hang on to. But I asked them what they were doing in London, because uh, I can't imagine John ever coming to London on his own. Um, and they said they were going for tea at the Ritz, and insisted that I should join them uh, with my friend. Um, <laughs> well, getting our table for tea at the Ritz in mid-February is pretty difficult. To add to their number uh, on a couple of days or a week or so before Christmas seemed impossible. But needless to say, Dinah ensured that we had a seat with them. Um, and uh, I, I mention this because I just cannot imagine John in his former life, before getting married, ever doing anything like going for tea at the Ritz. But there we go. Yeah. He had a wonderful marriage together, which certainly was curtailed because of uh, John's relatively early death. But they brought great happiness, and now I hope they'll be happy together again. Thank you for sharing with you. This time from Nigel Hardy, who is one of the next generation of New Zealand cousins, who is working at present in Oman and had very much hoped to be able to be with us here today, but his work unfortunately has prevented it. But he's written a few words as follows. When she and John travelled to New Zealand in the early 90s, I took her up on her kind offer to stay with her and John when we travelled to the UK. They couldn't have been kinder or more accommodating as they suddenly had two backpackers, myself and my future wife Justine, turn up on their doorstep in Reading. We got on tremendously well and she used to refer to us as the kids. <coughs> we enjoyed her sense of fun and of humour. She could be hard work, but she also had the ability to laugh at herself. John used to call her Madam, and a cup of tea delivered at her bedside each morning was expected. A few years later, when they were married with a young family, Nigel and Justine spent a few years on a job placement here in, in, over here in London. And they saw quite a bit of Diana in London, where John and she took them to watch cricket at Lord's, a real treat for two Kiwis, he said. And here in Hampshire, where they particularly remember splendid Sunday lunch with her at the Hatchet Inn. He says, she was tough and independent, not afraid of standing up to people and speaking her mind. We will always remember her fun-loving character, her kindness and keen sense of adventure. But as the years went on without John, she began to feel increasingly alone and lonely, and began to develop panic attacks and suffer lapses of memory. She managed to attend the weddings of both of our children, and when we retired to Bradford on Avon, we would often meet up with her in Salisbury for lunch, halfway between us. And one day she asked my wife and I if we would act as her next of kin, as she had no relatives in this country which we've been very happy to do. But as her health and mental ability began to decline further, it eventually became necessary to introduce daily carers, which she both partly welcomed, but also partly resented, as she fought so hard not to lose her marbles, as she insisted on always calling it. We can only be grateful to the teams of long-suffering carers first from Busy Bees and then Nurse Plus, who were so patient with her, as were the staff, staff at Andover Nursing Home, where she spent her last year. And a very special thank you is owed to Leonard Telford, Jean Pitfield and Robin Casson, who have given her true friendship and practical support over many years. I have to say that Dino was one of the most complex characters I've ever known. She prided herself on always telling people exactly what she was thinking, which is not usually the best way to cement friendships. <laughs> I'll never forget when Francis and I proudly showed her a photo of our 18-month, somewhat chubby grandson, 
She took one look and said, well, he's very fat. <laughs> I don't think she had any intention of being offensive. She was just stating what to her was obvious. But as we heard, and some of us know, she could be kind and generous, good company, and with a zest for life and a real sense of humour. But you may also know that sometimes she could be absolutely infuriating. But I've tried never to lose sight of the fact that at heart, she was especially in this last decade, a very lonely person, scared of what the future held for her, and who longed for the sort of family relationships that she saw others enjoying. Di Dinah did have a real lifelong faith, however, and although not a regular churchgoer, she enjoyed attending this church. I was also very pleased to hear that when she was ill, she did welcome Sue bringing Holy Communion to her at home. How appropriate then was our reading earlier, which was also chosen by Dinah for John's funeral 13 years ago, for it is one of the most comforting passages in the New Testament, where shortly before his death, Jesus tells his loyal disciples that he is soon to leave them, and that he's going to prepare a place for them. And Thomas blurts out that question that both Dinah and most of us, if we are honest, sometimes ask. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And in his answer, Jesus uses the imagery of home and family, with God as the father of us all. And in my father's house, he said, there are many rooms, room for us all. When we die then, it will be as if going to the loving welcome of our eternal home and family and to the peace which our Heavenly Father has prepared for us all. Today we may confidently leave Dinah, now and evermore, truly at rest and peace in her eternal home, in God's nearer presence. Amen. Amen. Will our Creator and Redeemer, by your power, Christ conquered death and entered into glory, Confident in his victory and claiming his promises, we entrust Dominic to your mercy in the name of Jesus our Lord, who died and is alive and reigns with you now and forever. Amen. Amen. May God give you his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Amen.